Welcome, everybody. It is so great to see you here. As the co-chair of the Neighborhood Funders Group, I am honored to welcome you to this next offering as part of our 40 Years Strong virtual convening series. My name is Amrita Morris. I'm the Director of National Community Strategies at the Annie Casey Foundation. And Neighborhood Funders Group is my political home in philanthropy. For those of you who are members and close friends of Eminent NSG, hello again. For those who are newer, we welcome you to learn more about us and think about joining in our commitment to connecting people, place, and power in philanthropy. In addition to being excited about today's offering um, in my role as co-chair of the board here, I also am excited as a former youth organizer. And so as somebody who started organizing when I was 16 in Houston and appreciated the adult allies and those who supported my development and political education. And then as a youth organizer, when I moved to DC, working with formerly incarcerated young people and their families uh, to, to advance alternatives to, to cages for, for young people, I am so inspired by the power of the work that is represented in the, the folks who are going to be sharing with you today. The way in which young people are leading in this moment and have always led in, in moments of transformation for, for our country and the world is unrivaled. And so I, I look forward to you being able to hear more about how you can support um, these amazing young people, how you can learn more about this work, and how you and your foundations, your institutions, your donor collaboratives can step up your investment and, and engagement in this work. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about today and the, and the timing of, of this conversation, I, it made me um, perhaps strangely think about the, the DNC. Uh, for those who were listening to Vice, Pre uh, Vice President Biden when he accepted the Democratic nomination, you may recall that he opened his speech quoting Ella Baker. And if you're like me and from the organizing tradition I am, you were surprised <laughs> to, to hear that in that space. Um, he quoted her um, with one of the, the pieces that many of us are familiar with, her saying, give light and the people will find a way. We know that this is absolutely a time where we need light. Um, we are bearing witness to, to violence in our communities and across the country, um, to moments of upheaval, and we have fires that are raging in our hearts and upon this land as changes in the political and physical climate here demand our attention. But thankfully, we also have um, light bearers. And the, the, the people that you will hear from today, they, they are speaking truth to power. They are speaking words of liberation. They are helping us to see what our dear sister um, Valerie has shared as a country. Perhaps we are not experiencing the darkness of the tomb, but rather the darkness of the womb that through the bold lead, their bold leadership, they are inviting us to be open to the radical life that is being born anew in our world and, and in our communities. Uh, we are, I am so delighted that they are going to be able to share with us today. I am excited about what they, they have to offer. I welcome you into this conversation and I also welcome you into further conversations that are a part of this continued um, 40 Years Strong convening series. So you'll be able to find those other conversations that are coming up um, throughout the rest of the fall on the NSU website. So please do um, take part and join us. But for now, I would remind you that the, something, and something else that Ella Baker told us <laughs> is that in order for us as poor and oppressed people to become a part of a society that is meaningful, the system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. So know that you are about to hear from light bearers who are about the business of radical change and transformation, and they are inviting us into that world with us with them. And so with that, I will turn it over to Alejandra. 
Thank you so much, Amoretta, for, um, for that grounding introduction um, into this panel. Uh, I'm very excited to be in community with you all. Thank you so much for, for participating in uh, this kickoff uh, session for NFG's um, fall webinar series. Um, I think to, to get us started, um, I just want to acknowledge um, that, that I know that many of us have been playing a leadership role um, in supporting your communities, your movement partners um, through the pandemic um, and over the last uh, few months as, we, as we've seen um, increased uh, police brutality um, and um, and making sure that y'all are supporting the engagement of organizing mobilization and education efforts that center black liberation and that really push um, for operationalizing um, transformational solidarity uh, within your institutions and within your roles. Um, and the demands that, you know, that are really going to um, help us shift to to the kind of uh, movement and transformative work that that the moment is calling us for. Um, I have to say that, um, although at times it has felt um, odd uh, for YEF even to continue sort of in the, the processes of the daily work, um, we do it because we know that for YEF as a, as a philanthropic partner that centers youth of color, it's necessary for us to do so. Um, and we're committed to, to continuing to trust and follow and fund the leadership of Black, Indigenous, and youth of color. Um, and we're clear that, that this is the way to build. So I uh, just want to welcome you to this. Thank you for joining us as, you know, hopefully this session will serve to re-energize yourself after hopefully a weekend where you have found some time for rest and joy as we step into this new season. Um, this month is also my birthday, so I feel like I'm starting off my birthday celebration um, in a very exciting way. Um, so during this session, you're gonna be hearing from an all young women of color panel um, that's, that represents uh, YEF movement partners, um, including from the NAACP Youth and College Division, One Arizona, Women Engaged, um, and they're going to be sharing with us really innovative ways in which they've adapted their work uh, to meet the multitude of social and environmental shifts that 2020 has presented. Um, also sharing with us the ways in which they're engaging a new wave of newly politicized uh, young people through issue based organizing and meeting them where they're at. Um, and we'll also dive into some of the infrastructures and partnerships. What do they currently look like in the States? Um, and at the national level, um, and also do some visioning as to what they can look like um, with additional support, um, especially for Black, Indigenous, and youth of color, led and focused organizations who are playing a key role in the civic engagement sector um, and advancing organizing efforts, planning, uh, and mobilizing that shifts the, our behavior around civic participation. Um, and definitely getting into what it is that, that we all need to do to ensure that the defining youth vote is present at the polls in 54 days at this point. Um, so these, these are the leaders that are gonna guide us through, through this new decade. Um, and I'm just looking forward to being in this conversation with you all as we listen, learn, um, and really make a commitment to, to take the leap um, that'll take us towards a dignified and just democracy. Um, so before I move on into the conversation, uh, I just want to do a quick um, introduction of YEF. Um, next slide. Thank you. So I'm Ale, as I shared, I'm Alejandra Ruiz, um, she, her, Ale. I'm the executive director at the Youth Engagement Fund. In November, it'll be two months into this, in, since I've been in this role. Um, I grew up undocumented in New York City and got involved in the immigrant uh, youth movement about 16 years ago. So that's how I come into the space. Um, and that is definitely reflected in um, our approach to leadership and grant making. Um, so the Youth Engagement Fund is the only donor um, collaborative that is dedicated to increasing the civic participation and elector of power of young people. We are led by an all young women of color, former organizers team under the age of 25, under the age of 35, look at me trying to like scrape up some ages. Um, 
and uh, we are really trying to uh, create intentional pathways that are uh, dismantling uh, instructional racism and white supremacy um, and that are um, providing pathways um, and new ways for to expand the electorate um, that is ultimately going to transform American democracy um, and and the elected um, officials and leaders that we're going to be seeing um, over the next uh, 10 and 20 years um, guiding us into this new space. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started um, with, uh, with introductions. So as I shared, um, I'm going to start with uh, Tiffany. So Tiffany is the director of the NAACP um, Youth and College Division. Um, and Tiffany, so if you could just uh, spend some time telling us about like who you are, a little bit about your organization, um, any information that will be helpful for us. Um, and uh, I think uh, for this first session, um, if you could just dive into, you know, what, how did your organization and membership adapt into the evolving and social political dynamics of this year? Um, and particularly, what did collaboration look like across movements um, and your organizational partners? Thanks, Ale. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, calling in from DC, but I just got back yesterday from Pittsburgh. And before that, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, fighting for um, Justice and Breonna Taylor. We actually just got, if you saw me looking away from my screen, we just got news that the Attorney General Daniel Cameron, who is in Louisville, Kentucky, who has not yet charged or arrested the officers, um, is on the nomination list for the Supreme Court of the United States by Donald Trump. So um, there is a lot going on right now, and I appreciate not only the invitation to be a part of this discussion, but also the recognition of the uh, severity of the moment that we're in right now. There's a lot going on, and we've invited a lot of folks to a lot of calls and a lot of Zooms. And so... Uh, we, we want to make this as purposeful as possible by making sure that we're honest um, and by making sure that y'all really understand what, what we're doing. Uh, this is so necessary for y'all to really understand how organizers are living, um, not just jobs, but their daily lives to support members across the country. So I'll start with a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, born and raised, uh, daughter, oldest daughter of a single mother from Algiers, New Orleans originally. I went to UC Santa Cruz. There are some folks on the chat who are messaging me who are also banana slugs, so I see y'all. And uh, class of 2011. <laughs> and I moved um, from LA to Santa Cruz in a transition where my mom told me, Tiffany, make sure you go to college and make sure you graduate. But my mom had not had that experience, so there was very little that she could give me to support me through that process. We also didn't have a car. I didn't have internet. This is back when AOL was a thing and you couldn't be on the phone and the internet at the same time. Uh, we also didn't have a computer at home. And so I made it my mission to figure out on my own how to get to college. And I remember my college counselor at uh, Birmingham High School, which is now a charter school. Dr. Black told me, she was a white woman. She told me, Tiffany, you're not gonna go to college. You should just go to community college in the neighborhood and get a job. And I was like, well, that's not what my mama told me to do. You got a different agenda. And my mom, she reigns over you. So I'm gonna go to college. And I applied to all the UCs. I only got into UC Santa Cruz. I'm so glad that I did. And uh, the Black Student Unions at the school and the university did a student-initiated outreach program to bring me up to the university for three days for free. I went on the program, fell in love with the students. There were 74 other kids. There were high school seniors who had been admitted to Santa Cruz that said, uh, we wanted to show you what it was like to be a Black student at a historically white university. So I went, enjoyed it, had a great time, and enrolled. I get to college my first year, my first quarter, enrolling and moving into the dorms. The regents of the California school system increased our tuition 32%. I was vice president of the student government. There were 18,000 students, 300 and maybe 70 of us were African American. I ran as vice president and then I ran for president. And while I'm in Sacramento, lobbying against tuition increases, somebody hung a noose on my door. So I tell my students and my organizers all the time, sometimes this work chooses us. And sometimes we have the blessing of being able to choose the work. My mom told me to go to college, that's it. I did not know that I would have to fight to get into school, that I would then have to fight to stay in school because they rose my tuition, and that one of my peers or a classmate or a student at the university would threaten my blackness by hanging a noose on campus that then resulted in no investigation and no announcement by the chancellor at the school. So you can imagine a young black girl, I wasn't bald headed at the time, I am now, you can imagine a young black girl with braids who is a minority at a historically white university who is just trying to do one thing, go to college and graduate. 
who has faced not only racial violence, but also financial and economic violence, um, educational violence, that, that the rage that I felt, that the fear that I had, that the, um, the, the mystery of what was possible and, and the mystery of uh, uh, tapping into my power and collective power, what that must have been like for someone like me. I'm thinking about the students who are in school right now and how my students at Florida Agricultural Mechanic University uh, had a, not only a hate crime on campus against the Latinx and, and the, um, uh, the Latinx community, but also are facing COVID-19 and are also facing uh, uh, police brutality because Tony McDade was murdered and answers have still not been delivered. Tony McDade is a, a, a trans woman who uh, was shot and killed by the police two months ago. And they got 16 people arrested yesterday at an action that happened. And so my students are not just trying to go to school and learn and do what our families encourage us to do by pursuing higher education, but they are also fighting a national pandemic and a racial pandemic, an economic pandemic, an educational pandemic. And, um, and, and we have to, as organizers on the national level, be aware of that. When the transition happened um, for uh, our transition at the national level at the NAACP was March 11th. When that happened, uh, our original three goals of how we organize our work, which is always leadership development, institutional capacity building, so that's building the NAACP chapters. We have 320 of them around the country. And the last one is campaign direct action organizing. Those had to pivot. A lot of the things we had already been doing because this generation of folks that I work with, Generation Z and the millennials, we grew up in the transitioned and or only no social media and online access, right? So we had to help people pivot to how to use those tools in ways that don't exhaust people, that take up lanes and, and, and take advantages of uh, ways that people need to be engaged and also give them the best practices because a lot of them had not been full-blown experts in digital communications or online communications or uh, theories of media replication. Like we, we had not had those conversations with folks because we didn't really need to. So we hosted a series of uh, trainings for our folks locally, in our regions, in our states. We did over 53 online programs across the country that wielded somewhere between 14,000 to 14,500 new organizers that we gathered. We hosted a program called Black Civic Summer that was a five series, Tuesday at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. civic engagement training. We focused on Black people versus the police, Black people versus the vote, Black people versus the census, Black people versus elections, and Black people versus the Black agenda, where we brought in guests and partners, right, from Planned Parenthood, from Move on Texas, from um, United We Dream, from the Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools. We had elected officials. We had uh, civic engagement directors from other organizations. We had Vote.org, our, our national partner. They joined us. We had Politicking the App, which is a Black-owned um, uh, voter guide that's nonpartisan. We had them join us. We had uh, an opportunity where folks from local communities and organizers from Movement for Black Lives or the New Georgia Project or Dream Defenders came to join us to have conversations about the work that they're doing. And then in real life on those calls, we had examples of ways that people can get involved and engaged uh, to take direct action, to show them how easy it is, how easy it is to do it and how easy it is to track it. We then had uh, uh, an opportunity where everybody across the world, literally the world, was contacting me and our youth and college division asking for comments about the police murders across the country, um, about elections, about voter suppression, about schools coming back, about student debt, since that's a huge issue and the bills have been arising uh, and canceling and, and pausing student loan debt repayments. And so I said, we have to have an intentional way of making sure that I am not the face of the organization because I'm not, my seat is rented. I wanna make sure that the members in the NAACP are the ones who are taking up so much space across the country. So Major Woodall, who is the youngest youth and college president that we've had in Georgia in its history, who's 24 years old, he's the president of the adult state conference, not the youth and college portion, but the adult state conference. We put him on more platforms and stages. DeAngelique Jackson, who's a student at Fresno State University, she's the president of the NAACP. We put her on more platforms and stages because she organized a 3,500 person march and then got appointed to the police advisory council in Fresno. We had platforms for Kyra Mitchell, who is my chair for the youth committee on the national level. We had uh, more platforms, the video went viral. You probably saw it and didn't even realize it was her, but Leslie Redman, who was a 22 year old state conference president for Minneapolis, 
her video went viral after the press conference, after the murder of um, uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis. We're seeing it right now in Kenosha, Wisconsin with Jacob Blake. We've uplifted our students there. We've uplifted our students in Kentucky after the Breonna Taylor case, excuse me, after the Breonna Taylor law was passed and Jada Hampton, who was arrested with Until Freedom, uh, was, was uh, featured not only in the Huffington Post, but in the New York Times. Um, so we've gotten 59 young people who have had national public speaking engagements. And that is a part of our leadership development strategy. And then I know that uh, the NAACP has made a public uh, remark, the board of directors has taken a national stance to pause the uh, uh, in-person gatherings because of our safety for COVID-19. But I want us to sit for three seconds, thank you. I want us to sit for a second and think about this. How serious is the moment where young people will take to the streets, regardless of COVID-19, to demand justice for Black lives? How serious are we in the moment right now where young people are walking out of school during COVID-19 to demand justice because a hate crime happened on their campus? We had 17 national rallies that happened with our students across the country who have said, listen, NAACP, we acknowledge and recognize that you, you care about our safety, but but right now we cannot afford to sit inside. We can't afford to just be virtual. We can't afford to sit on a Zoom or an Instagram Live. We have to put our bodies on the line and be in the streets. And so I had to join my students in Louisville, Kentucky these last two weeks to support them on the ground because of what's happening. I had to make sure that I supported my people in Pittsburgh and in Kenosha, Wisconsin in person. Even here in DC, when the marches and protests were happening, I had to make sure I sort of supported them out loud in person. And so although we've had to pivot to virtual because of COVID, we should recognize that the um, principles of organizing have not changed and are still important. So I wanted to give you all that roadmap so that you can see the work that we've done. You can see what the, what the tension and what the um, uh, climate is currently across the country with young black students. And I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you so much, Tiffany, um, for that grounding um, and really, you know, just sort of bringing us, like you said, to the severity um, of the moment um, and the role of particularly young people of color and the type of leadership that they are um, stepping into during this uh, climate. Um, so next we're going to have um, Montserrat um, Arredondo, who is the executive director um, of One Arizona. Um, so Monse, if you can again introduce yourself, um, share a little bit about uh, One Arizona uh, and how you all have adapted um, to, the, to the changes of this year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone so much for having me and for being here today. We have had Zoom calls all day, every day. So it means a lot to have folks active and on this call hearing from from us and from other groups that you may not be familiar with. Again, my name is Montserrat Arredondo. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. I go by Monse. I'm born and raised here in Arizona and, and I'm a daughter of an undocumented woman who to this day does not have a path to citizenship or a way to become, um, to get a legal status in our country. Um, but I grew up really, um, in a community that understood that our parents were dealing with something that wasn't fair or a disadvantage, whether that was language, many of us were Latino or Vietnamese, um, or an actual legal status like my mom who was undocumented. But we were a very tight knit community. I grew up in public housing, so we all shared the same backyard and um, went to the same school, then the same high school in our transition to high school. I mean, to college a lot like Tiffany was a challenge. We knew that we were gonna go to college. It was something that our moms told us we were going to do. Um, and we were set, set to make that happen. And in order to apply for college and to apply for res resources like FAFSA, um, folks had to provide a social security number. Um, so at that time, some of the young people in my life my same age, a lot of them, a lot smarter than me, um, were finding out for the first time that they were undocumented. This is back in 2009. Um, their parents hadn't told them that, or they didn't have a, and they also didn't have a time and a place that they needed it or had, had to know. Um, so it was a huge challenge. It was a, a rude awakening of um, a, a tight-knit community and realizing that we were gonna have to 
move apart. So some of us went to college and some of us um, were not able to. Um, but we wanted to do something about it. We were transitioning from high school to college and we started to look out into the community. And I found a space called Neighborhood Ministries. It is actually a part of One Arizona um, to do some civic engagement work. At the time they had just done um, some canvassing in their neighborhood to find out what was the issue that folks cared about the most. This is a highly immigrant community, mostly Latino again, and they all said education. So these are all parents that were prioritizing education over immigration, something that was affecting their life in the long term, but they were really seeing what's affecting me right now. So in um, 2009, 2010, we were hoping to pass um, reform. We were on a campaign, Reform Immigration for America. It was a national campaign. Some of you might have been a part of that, RIFA. And um, soon we found out that SB 1070, that Show Me Your Papers law, was coming through our legislature here in the state of Arizona. And this is a law that came after many years of being under Sheriff Joe Arpaio's knee, I'll say, um, because he was um, separating families, um, terrorizing communities, putting up checkpoints and having what is known as 10 city his jail in our state for many years, even before S SB 1070 happened. And that was really the tipping point because it was a law that affected not just undocumented people, but anybody that didn't look white. So you could be asked for your passport in the street. You could be stopped um, because you had a particular bumper stickers. We saw trainings that police um, were, have, were getting and sheriffs were getting um, talking about rosaries around the car mirror or particular um, bumper stickers and things like that. So this is something that affected a lot of people. So we saw a huge uprising of people. We spent 109 days at the Capitol without leaving. We would spend the night there to try to show the moral dilemma that was SB 1070. And our governor at the time, who became governor after um, Janet Napolitano, our governor at the time who was elected, um, went to work with Obama. Um, and she signed the bill and got a huge amount of support. And again, my life shifted, realizing that the state of Arizona, the bubble that I lived in, this poor community that in my life was just um, a place of support, a place that I trusted everyone, was actually a lot bigger. Arizona was huge and there was a lot of racist people in our state and that Arpaio uh, is also an elected person. The sheriff is an elected person and people were choosing to have him in our state. So we got mobilized and in 2010, uh, when Arizona actually became a coalition, uh, immigrant rights groups came together like Puente, Mi Familia Vota, um, Neighborhood Ministries, Promise Arizona, and case a labor rights group um, came together to form this coalition so that we can maximize the little resources that we had. So we would um, help to keep track of where everybody was at and then keep track of all the work that we were doing. And in 2012, we did 12,000 voter registrations. I was a part of that and um, were able to start a new movement. And I think since 2010, the next big wave of organizations that have started big organizing groups that have come up was 2016 after when that presidential race was coming up and after we actually saw our coalition grow not just um, regionally at, at other parts of the state but also um, by constituency groups so now we have black led organizations asian american led organizations and our and our biggest partner right now that we're working to Elevate, which is our native vote program with native led organizations as part of One Arizona. Um, and we saw that shift after the presidential race and now have gone from 14 organizations in 2010 to 25 organizations to this day. And I think that was time. Thank you so much, Monse, uh, for sharing sort of um, that arc of, of engagement um, and of growth. Um, hearing Monse, I think, really sort of brings me back to, 
to inviting you all and for us to remember that uh, power building takes time, right? Um, and when we, and you know, when we're engaging with a lot of the youth leaders that are here now, a lot of youth leaders actually got involved in 2010 um, when there was a lot of sort of policies that were attacking them, them and their communities. Um, and I remember uh, last fall, I went to Arizona. Um, it was sort of a last minute trip and I reached out to Monsa and I was like, hey, I'd love to meet with um, the partners of One Arizona that are advancing youth civic engagement work. I thought there were gonna be six folks showing up and there were 22 groups that showed up on a Friday morning to have breakfast with me. Um, and, and it was amazing. So, you know, I think um, it's important for us to really think about what, what the conditions are that we're in now in 2020 um, uh, to, to ensure that the, the infrastructure and the work is supported for the long run. Um, so we're going to move on now to, to Georgia, where um, I was there in February. I was one of the last visits that I was able to make before the shutdown, and we had started having a conversation about sort of the youth civic engagement space in Georgia uh, and hoping to maybe have a similar <laughs> breakfast meeting um, in the spring that unfortunately did not happen. Um, but I got an opportunity to meet Michelle there. Um, and, you know, and she shared that there's like over 60 uh, young people in, in Georgia that are connected online and, um, and engaging in, in a lot of the civic engagement work happening there. Um, so Michelle, if you could just um, introduce yourself, share with us about Women Engaged um, and how Women Engaged has adopted um, given the shifts of 2020. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you all for being here today. Um, yes, my name is Michelle. I go by they, she pronouns and of course based here in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where we do all, a bulk of our work in the surrounding areas. I came to Women Engage about three years ago um, when I was 26 and my pathway into organizing um, has definitely been a long one. I was just a young person who was always very much had an affinity for political engagement. And so got involved fairly early on. Um, I was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri um, and spent a lot of time doing some political work there with the Kansas City Youth Commission um, and leading that effort. I soon moved to Arkansas and spent some years there for undergrad and then of course moved here to Atlanta, Georgia initially for graduate school and then found myself a nice space here with Women Engage. So on the screen here, we have a picture of our uh, founders, Malika Redman on the left and Margaret Carbo on the right. They founded Women Engage in 2014 to really address some of the uh, issues when it comes to like the transactional, transactional nature of civic engagement when it comes to engaging with Black folks, especially Black youth, Black women, Black femmes, um, and other youth of color. So we really wanted to do some deeper investment into not only talking about the importance of civic engagement, but really curating and nurturing the youth leadership in our communities. So we are at the intersections of civic engagement and reproductive justice and move a lot of that work using the reproductive justice framework. The, that framework was created in 1994 by a group of 12 Black women and femmes with, whose goal was really to expand the conversation around reproductive um, rights to be more inclusive of Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color for some of the issues that really impact us in ways that had not necessarily been talked about before. And so we uh, launched with our flagship program, We Vote, We Rise, which is our integrated voter engagement program. If we can go to, yes, perfect. <laughs> so um, in which we not only provide voter education, but also leadership development. And that goal is to really take move and low propensity, move new and low propensity voters to be more active and engaged, not only in just the voting process, but in civic participation beyond the ballot box. So we target areas in Southwest Atlanta and the surrounding Atlanta metro area. We've recently expanded to seven counties. And the picture on the right, I actually just have a really soft spot for because when I first started in 2017, like my first day, I was training these two young folks. They were as students at Spelman College at the time. And I think really speak to the heart of the work that we do with our program because now they're also colleagues with me. They work with me in strategy sessions because they are now organizers in their own right. The person on the left, their name is Quincy and they work with another reproductive justice organization here in Georgia and the other person on the, um, I met Quincy on the left, sorry you all, you know, orientation of PowerPoints. And then we have Jill on the right, 
who is also another grassroots organizer doing a lot of work around the current uprisings that are happening um, in Georgia in the aftermath of, of course, George Floyd, but then also Rashard Brooks, who was murdered at the Wendy's um, in early June. So I just really wanted to highlight some of their leadership and also just talk about like, that we, through our program, see this as more of an investment. Integrated voter engagement is really about deepening relationships and being able to take the conversations that we have behind closed doors and really bringing them to light to hold our greater community and elected officials accountable to really addressing those needs. And it really comes with centering those kind of conversations because in our program, we definitely uplift the history in which oftentimes most of the time, people will parachute into Black, predominantly Black communities, tell us what we need to vote for, how their vote is going to do something for them, and seldom see the benefits, where in turn, we should actually be listening to our communities, hearing what they're doing, hearing what they need, and then talking about how we can actualize that and see that in progress. So we actually do our work year round, regardless if there's an election. We are oftentimes on the ground, knocking on doors at festivals, at bus stations, um, over the phone, through text message, just trying to engage with our communities to understand what's going on. And in times that, are, that we don't have an election, we're actually conducting deep dive canvases just to know about the issues that really resonate with our folks and also providing pathways for different trainings um, and opportunities to expand their understanding horizon on how to use the tools necessary because our belief is really about neighbors talking to neighbors, community talking to community to really build movement and power. So of course, with 2020 being what it is, we're no longer really knocking on doors. So we definitely switched over to uh, remote and digital outreach like other folks have uplifted. Tiffany mentioned have you about before about providing this training for folks, um, especially for those of us who are millennials and Gen Zers, because we were, came up with technology was a little bit of a challenge in a sense that I don't know what the proper term is for the clicker on your computer, but that's what I call it. And so <laughs> realizing that there were different barriers to really knock down initially, but we were able to really uh, support our team. First, we were able to retain all 15 of our Canvas members, and we quickly uh, pivoted to a remote and digital strategy well before the state response in Georgia had actually taken place. Um, so what that meant was that we made sure that people had equipment, whether it was hotspots, laptops, cell phones, so they can be set up where they're at home and feel supported in that. Uh, we also then quickly changed our script. So at the time, we were actually in the midst of doing our outreach for the primaries here in Georgia, which we all know was a fiasco come June, but initially this was in March. So we quickly changed uh, our script to include a community response question to really start connecting our folks with resources to assist them in their time of need. Um, we really want to prioritize the humanity of our communities, especially highlighting the fact that like we're in the midst of a pandemic that disproportionately impacts Black communities in the context of the current uprisings and the ongoing systemic issues, as well as just access to healthcare, because Georgia um, is, of course, one of the states that has not expanded Medicaid here. So there is a huge healthcare wage gap uh, when it comes to getting access to services here. So we wanted to make sure to create a community response question. And with that, we also gave crisis management training um, for our, our team members, just so they can be trained on how to engage in those conversations. And over time, we've been able to actually call back and give assistance to over 200 people so far who have needed that type of assistance. Um, and then of course, just the shift into digital trainings and outreach really is about adapting and still trying to create spaces of connection while also honoring the humanity of folks and where they are. Um, and so for us, you'll see on the right, that's actually a picture of our team uh, about a couple of weeks ago, um, just taking some time to take a break, celebrate each other, um, have some fun. And I think that's really where we are now is that in the midst of this, there's definitely a deeper need to have deeper conversations with our folks. Um, and the work that we're currently engaging, um, we did work for the primaries and then over the summer we've been doing voter uh, registration. And what that means is, is that it's not enough to just put a post out online anymore, but it really does take multiple touches and being very intentional and really having the patience and the grace to have those conversations knowing that the world is literally on fire. 
So sometimes, and it kind of translates to how it was before the pandemic, when we were, before we were practicing social distancing, where oftentimes we would go to bus stations and sometimes I would see somebody there, the same person every week that I was there. And it wasn't until week six or seven that they finally decided to engage with me. And we're still having those same type of um, encounters now just in the digital space. But of course, with that in mind, knowing that because people are a little bit more bold <laughs> when they're behind screens or when it's a text message and stuff that some of the responses might be a little bit different. So really our biggest thing right now is about making sure that we adapted our trainings and tools to set up our Canvas team to be um, really great organizers, especially with this new way of normal as we lean more into the digital capacity, digital organizing, and also to um, really just make sure that we're supporting people and actualizing that humanity of folks. So when the uprising started, started happening, we made sure to have space and continue to debrief the things that were going on in our communities, as well as um, you know, have that opportunity to talk about current events, just so they can be better prepared um, when they're having conversations with folks so nothing can really take them by surprise and they feel more comfortable and engaged in conversation. Um, so I am going to end it at that. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for sharing about the work that's um, happening in Georgia. Um, and I think uh, Michelle's presentation uh, really lifts up uh, the way that a lot of YEF movement partners um, approach civic and voter engagement work, uh, which is through issue-based organizing, through talking to young people and their communities about issues that affect them in their daily lives um, and have tangible, um, tangible effects on, on how they live, um, and then making those connections to them about, you know, how is that connected to to having agency over their vote, um, to, to changing the behavior around civic participation and what does it mean to become lifelong civic participants and sort of start creating that culture within their families. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I am a product of investment um, in young people and I will forever bet on young people, right? And I feel like um, even in the conversations, like young people are really starting to make changes in their kitchen tables. Um, having conversations um, around abortion access, around climate justice, um, around uh, agency over their vote with their families while they're having um, their meals. So I think um, we want to we want to hear from you all, right? Um, I think when we talk about the youth civic engagement sector, sometimes uh, it can feel like this sort of uh, abstract idea. What does it mean? How are people defining it? Um, and uh, one of our, actually, if we can go back to the previous slide, I do want to make a point on that. Um, one of the research partners that we work with um, is Circle, and um, they have been doing a lot of work, and they continue to do work around the youth vote. Um, and over this past year, YEF has been in conversations um, with them around um, expanding the breadth of their youth electoral significant in significance index which is a tool that um, sort of helps identify where young people and the youth vote um, can make a big impact. Um, and over this last year, they have included additional factors um, that really allow us to sort of get into the depth of the leadership and the involvement of young people of color. Um, and if we, and I'm gonna just put here on the chat, the link to it. Um, if anyone is interested, we can also do a follow-up with this. Uh, but in this last reiteration of it, they saw that young people could really have the power to change, um, you know, what the, the election looks like um, in places like Alabama and Arizona. Um, so we want to just check in with you all um, to see what is the youth civic engagement, what you know about the youth civic engagement sector um, as we get ready to, to take a break um, and then move into the next phase of the conversation. So for this part, uh, this is going to be an interactive piece of the presentation. Uh, we are going to be putting, if you look on the site on the chat, uh, there is a link to a Jamboard, uh, which is a nice uh, tool where you can use post-its to respond to your questions. Uh, and we have two questions on the Jamboard uh, that we want to engage you with. The first question is, um, Ooh, let me see. Uh, okay. Does the information that you've been presented with today um,
confirm or challenge your understanding of youth of color leadership in the civic engagement sector? And what opportunities do you see for youth of color uh, leaders and organizations working to transform our democracy? I feel like, <laughs> all right, so we're just gonna give you all a few minutes to, to add your notes on here. Let us know if you have any trouble. And we sort of try to set up a system where uh, everybody's not crowded with their post-it. So um, if you can put in your answers based on your that correspond to the first letter of your first name, as noted here. Maybe we have two phones, do one example. All right. Where are we? All right, I'm gonna go in here and do an example for folks. We're just trying to gauge uh, audience knowledge. Awesome. Okay, I see folks putting in their postings. Thank you. And thank you for for engaging with us uh, in this activity and with this tool. I'm just gonna read out the questions again. So we have two questions on here. The first one is, what thoughts come to mind when you think about the youth civic engagement sector? What do you want to know about it? And the second question is, what opportunities do you see for youth of color leaders and organizations working to transform democracy? Let's see. Okay, so we have a couple of folks that are new to the space. Thank you for joining. Later on in the presentation, we're also going to share our contact. Um, we're happy to continue this conversation. So some folks are sharing. I'd love to hear more about leadership development strategy, key ingredients. Youth of color leaders are our future and we must be hyper-focused on building and expanding. What opportunities are there? Voter engagement and community mobilizing, expanding spaces and audiences for mass political education through digital engagement, yes. Alrighty. All right, any last post? We are about to wrap up this piece. Awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts. Again, and we will also be sharing this with you all um, afterwards so that you can have um, the information. Okay, so we are almost getting ready to, uh, to take a break. Uh, 
but we are going to do one more activity <laughs> before that and that is a poll um, so if we can pull up the poll please at this time all right so um so everyone in this audience are philanthropic partners, right? Um, and so we just wanna, we're trying to get, get a, a sense of, of what the involvement is in terms of supporting youth work. Uh, the first question up, if you can see it now, are there youth organizations in your grant making portfolio? Yes or no? And then um, if so, if you can estimate what percentage of your philanthropic institution's budget is guided to youth of color, uh, organizations in particular. So we'll just give a few moments for that. Oh, I'm realizing that I forgot to scroll down on the poll. <laughs> so we have two more questions. Yes, I think the third one is really, um, you know, we, we're always engaging in rapid response funding. Um, so we're trying to get a sense of what that looks like in terms of supporting youth of color led or serving organizations as well. All right. So we're going to end the poll in three, two, one. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Okay, so for the first one, yes. So the majority of you do have uh, youth organizations in your grant making portfolio. What percentage of your budget um, is going to youth of color led organizations? Uh, the vast majority said less than 25%. The third question is what percentage of your rapid response funding for any area of work went to youth of color led or serving organizations? Uh, the answer is also 20, less than 25% for the vast majority. And do you believe that youth of color are key stakeholders in shaping a transformative democracy? Uh, the answer for that is 100%. All right, so I think we are here to try to get some alignment in regards to our belief that young people of color are key stakeholders in shaping our democracy and getting our budgets and our funding support uh, to match that. Uh, so thank you all so much for sharing. Uh, we are going to go ahead and take a 10 minute break. And when we come back into the next piece, um, we are gonna dive deeper into some of the work, like what does the infrastructure look like? What opportunities are there? Um, dig a little bit more into um, like youth collaboratives um, and so what the work is gonna be looking like uh, from now until November. So um, when do we want folks to come back? Okay, so if everyone can please be back and joining us at 1.05 p.m. Eastern uh, so we can continue this conversation. Thank you all and have a good break. All righty. Welcome back everyone. I hope that you had a nice break. Um, and are ready to, to continue with the same energy for the remaining of this conversation. Um, so we saw a lot of things in this last session um, around like how, you know, around the importance of youth leadership um, and, and how folks are activated um, and also what that means in terms of the, the work that's happening at the local level um, and, and what opportunities are there. So why, why are we talking about the youth civic engagement sector? Um, over the course of, of the time that you know, we've been in this space, we've learned that the youth civic engagement sector is, is a vibrant, uh, multifaceted and dynamic space. Um, it's also a very large space um, and it involves a lot of organizations, local, state-based um, and national in focus. 
uh, and a lot of leaders that are advancing issue-based organizing um, to, to try to proactively change the behavior around civic participation. Um, and as I shared, really ensure that uh, young people of color in their communities um, are having ownership and agency of what their vote means um, and what that looks like tangibly in their everyday lives. And I feel like, um, you know, when I think about 2020, I feel like we're really in a moment of, of transformational solidarity and engagement where it's important for us as philanthropic partners who are values and movement aligned to get behind the leadership and innovation um, of youth led focused organizations and leaders that are gonna be harnessing the energy of their peers and their communities into civic participation in the upcoming months. Uh, some of them have already done so through the primaries this summer um, and really as we're leading up to the general election. Uh, this is a pivotal time for, for the future of the youth vote uh, in a moment of deep political consciousness uh, and engagement that really cannot be overlooked um, and must be resourced robustly. Um, so with that said, um, I wanna stay in this, start this set of the conversation um, to talk a little bit about the, the infrastructures uh, that, are, that are at the local level um, in terms of youth civic engagement organizations. So I'm gonna get started with Tiffany, um, but I remember that um, last year uh, at the, actually almost a year ago, um, there were several youth organizations that gathered for the Youth Action Summit. Um, which was hosted by the Alliance for Youth Organizing, uh, which included partnerships who were in the steering committee like uh, the NAACP Youth and College Division, Next Gen America, Planned Parenthood Federation, their Generation Division, uh, Student Power Network, and United We Dream. Uh, so these are organizations that are advancing high impact civic engagement programs and really were gathering to connect, build, strategize, and amplify their work. Uh, so we had a conversation around exploring what it would look like to have a shared space for the youth civic engagement sector where they could um, sort of have a space to learn from each other, to coordinate, to come into alignment, um, but also to, um, to share with, uh, with philanthropic and organizational partners what the depth um, and expansion of the, of the space looked like. Um, so Tiffany, um, I want to get started with you. Um, you were part of that very first conversation that we had um, and then also joined us when we did uh, a briefing uh, in November. So if you can just please share uh, some of your insights um, in regards to how you see um, the, the youth civic engagement infrastructure at the national level now and what opportunities are there. Um, and then we can dive right into um, the role specifically of the NAACP Youth and College Division in that space. Sure, thank you, Ale. So I had to make sure I take notes, um, even though we have our notes on the Google Doc. I, um, I wanna start probably with helping you all understand uh, the infrastructure there's, there's been waves of the youth movement. I've been in the youth movement for the last 12 years at the national level. There's been waves of bodies of folks that have existed. Um, a lot of us are still here doing the same work and supporting the new generation of people who are leading as executive directors or uh, lead staff of nonprofit youth of color organizations. We used to have an organization called the Generational Alliance, which was a collection of organizations and executive directors that supported and led all of the national work by giving voices, uh, resources, and space to people on the ground. That no longer exists. I think that sort of ended around 2013, 14, I wanna say. And um, since then, there have been multiple re reiterations of what that has looked like. Um, of course, the YEF space has been super, um, uh, it's been a cornerstone in that work and in in what we've needed to do and wanted to do, but all of us still have the same relationships. Our infrastructure with the NAACP, thank you. Our, our, um, it does work. Um, our infrastructure with the NAACP um, and what's happened across the country has also shifted. So I used to be the president of the National Student Association. It was called USSA, United States Student Association. And I don't know if y'all are familiar with the labor movement attacks that have happened across the country, uh, specifically California versus AFSCME, uh, but there has been an, an attempt to disorganize structured organizing on the ground. That attack also happened on student associations. There used to be 12 of them across the country. There are now only three. California, Oregon, and Arizona. Arizona is rebuilding. Um, these, these spaces and infrastructure allowed student voices to one, have their own autonomy, but two, 
uh, create space for their own agency to advocate and to fight for what they wanted for. So if students, like I said when I, in, my, in my intro story, if they wanted to fight against student fees, we were able to do that through our student governments, but also through a statewide student association in California called the um, United, uh, uh, University of California Student Association. Uh, in Wisconsin, there was actually a state statute, 36095, that said that students had the uh, agency to decide what they wanted to do for their own agenda. That has since been stricken. And United Council, that student association has disappeared. There's been an attack on structured organizing. And so I joined the NAACP in 2018, knowing that at the intersections of young organized chapters and Black people, that's exactly where I needed to be. I didn't know a pandemic would hit and I would be here doing this job now in this moment, as I'm sure none of us did. But at the intersection of that, that structured organized, that structured infrastructure, that structured organizing of an infrastructure, uh, I knew that there was an opportunity for us to continue to build that. And USSA kind of uh, has, has gone through like a dip and is coming back slowly and surely. And there have been other opportunities and chances to build national networks like that. There's um, the Power Student Network, there's a Boat Mob, there's the groups that you're listening to now on the panel. Um, and, and then there's obviously the uh, Black Youth Project and there's Movement for Black Lives and et cetera. And so the NAACP Youth and College Division currently right now has 230 chapters across the country, right? 230 chapters, I work with everybody 25 years and old and younger in the NAACP. And we have high school, middle school and college chapters in the NAACP Youth and College Division. That infrastructure that exists uh, does help with continuity. Y'all know and I know very well that everybody tries to slam young organize, youth organizing by saying that that's a high turnover, which is factual, but sometimes that works to our benefit. Most of the time it works to our benefit. We also know that um, not only with the high turnover, but also um, with the uh, vehicles of institutions that exist, we allow students to then uh, organize themselves and also turn over their leadership into other, uh, excuse me, into the incoming class so that they're able to carry the torch and continue the baton of the work that we're able to do. That comes through student governments, it comes through black student unions, it comes through um, METCHAs, it comes through the queer student union, it comes through the women's center, whatever group exists, it's seen as at Santa Cruz for undocumented students, whatever group exists, we're able to pass the torch and to build leaders who are able to carry on the work. And so uh, the slide that you're looking at right now on the screen is uh, an effort, like I mentioned earlier, for us to uplift the voices of the young people who are doing the work on the ground, who are also passing the torch. So the New York Times, uh, ABC, Scottsdale Progress, uh, CNN, we had students who were able to then share uh, their platform and the work they were doing with not only the organizing that they had, but the rallies that they were doing in an effort to push an agenda on the local and statewide level. This is important because a lot of times you'll just see adults or you'll see commentators, right, on, on, on the news. My job is to make sure that you can listen to the people who might not have as many followers on Instagram, who might not have had the proper media training or have a law degree, but are actually on the ground doing the real work and who you need to hear from because they are a credible, legitimate source. So those are some of our highlights and some of our folks. This is actually like a month ago, so there's definitely some more that we have. Next slide, please. We, um, this, this picture that you're looking at of this young lady, her name is Jail Karundi. She's the first black president at the University of um, Minneapolis, or excuse me, Minnesota. And uh, after the murder of George Floyd, she wrote a letter to her chancellor demanding that the school cut the contract with the off-campus PD. In less than 12 hours, her chancellor responded and said, okay. It didn't happen just because she wrote a letter. It happened because there had been organizing work before that, of course. So we included her in training that we wanted to do for campuses across the country. I, I put out a post on my social media, my personal social media, and there were over 230 schools that reached out. They include chance, uh, excuse me, counselors, uh, high school students, school board representatives, student leader and organizers, and NAACP folks who said, hey, we wanna be able to, thank you, we wanna be able to find out how they did that and replicate and do the same thing. Since then, the letters and petitions that have come out are from these schools, University of Texas, Austin, that list of schools, uh, to not only replicate what she's done, but to then expand it with an eight can't wait campaign to say, listen, we're not just gonna kick you off a of campus. We're also gonna hold you to regulations to reform you, to defund you, to do these things, to make sure that our communities and our schools are safe. Next slide, please. This is a map of um, uh, the Black Civic Summer that I mentioned earlier. Again, our civic engagement work has now had to all be digital. 
We have a national partnership with vote.org. Vote.org gave us our own personalized link. We made, we made the purchase for it. We have a national partnership with them. And so we are sharing the link. The link allows you to do two things and you can do it also from vote.org. You can register to vote at vote.org. You can also check your status, your registration status on vote.org. You can also file for your absentee ballot on vote.org, pending of course where you live because regulations and things. I'm of the personal belief that elections should be universal, but we're not there yet. I, I'm ahead of my time. So, so vote.org allows people to do things according to their state. And so this is a map of uh, the folks that we were able to engage and train who are now going to organize come next Friday, um, Black Voter Day, where our folks are getting t-shirts and door hangers and window signs and face masks and hand sanitizer and stickers and posters. And they're gonna be sharing and making a bigger presence and splash in their community. These are the numbers of folks that we have uh, from the NAACP side and our volunteers who are going to help coordinate those efforts. And we've partnered with elected officials, students, actors, celebrities um, that you can see on the left-hand side who are organizing their own conversations. This is the last thing I'm gonna say because time is up. Oh, two more minutes, thank you. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna say is uh, on this slide is this. I, 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 in terms of leadership development and the civic engagement work, I one of the tidbits that I'm gonna give you all for free is that it's the messenger matters, right? I was organizing in 2018 in Tallahassee where we flew, not we, I wasn't the person who did it, I had the money, but Oprah and all these celebrities, Tiffany Haddish, and DJ Khaled, and Ty Tribbett, and all these people came to have a giant rally for elections, encouraging people to turn out to vote the next morning. The next morning we were at the precinct in Florida and not only was it empty, nobody was there to vote all day, but also, or not nobody, but like it was very, very low turnout, but also Tallahassee, which, this is nonpartisan and I'm nonpartisan, but just for, for your understanding. Um, Tallahassee, which was uh, ran by the mayor, uh, Andrew Gillum, of course, who's running for governor. Tallahassee went red and also the state of Florida went red. So we found that like when we try to use celebrities, thank you, when we try to use celebrities, it doesn't always work, especially if they're flying in from outside places. Michelle said it earlier, listen, you can't just be flying people all over the country into random places telling them what to do. That's not how this works. And so the, the mechanism that the NAACP Youth and College Division uses is we have our own members and our own leaders and our own organizers in every city across the country, and they are the best messengers. So these pictures that you're looking at are my young people for the first time ever trying to do a Zoom or trying to do a national conversation, excuse me, a statewide or local conversation around the issues that matter most to them. We have uh, our folks who are in Georgia who are organizing around Georgia issues. We don't need California people to come talk to Georgia, right? We don't need our folks in, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, hearing from folks from uh, Florida. Florida got their own issues, Kentucky got their own issues. And again, the, the idea of building capacity, which Ale said takes time, is we have to invest in the leaders that are currently there because those are the folks who live there, right? If we have folks who come from outside the country and come from all over the place to come do that work, then they don't leave the infrastructure and then those folks can't do the work on their own. And we are all about, I'm sure I speak for all my, my colleagues on the panel, we are all about making sure that our folks have their own power, their own voices and their own agencies to move their agenda. Um, I think that's my last slide. Yep, that's my last slide. Thank y'all so much. I'll take questions afterwards. Yes, thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, yes, uh, we are gonna be stepping into Q&A and more of an interactive discussion right after this um, set of presentations. So please write down any questions that you have or information that you wanna share um, for us to, to bring into the space. Um, so next we're gonna move uh, back into Arizona. So uh, Monse uh, is gonna share with us a little bit about the uh, AZ Youth Power Coalition work that's happening there. Um, this one feels particularly bittersweet because a lot of these uh, collaborative efforts at the state and national level um, that YEF is supporting, we were envisioning that they were gonna start in March. Um, and then um, that obviously did not pan out that way. Um, but we're looking forward to, to continuing to supporting um, local youth infrastructure um, in Arizona, Georgia, Florida, and at the national level. Um, so Monse, if you can just um, sort of walk us through what, what is happening with the Youth Power Coalition um, and, and you know, what the work is looking like over the next uh, few months. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Um, and we just um, started to kind of reimagine our, it used to be called Student Vote Coalition, um, but we really wanted to also um, emphasize that young people and these organizations aren't just doing civic engagement work, they're organizing all year round, empowering youth, 
um, showing up to city council meetings, showing up to school board meetings, partic participating in their um, college or high school governing experiences, and then also doing that at their organization level. So since this year, just this year, we reimagined it and it's called um, Arizona Youth Power Coalition, where partners unite to empower, engage, and develop youth to be change makers in Arizona and leaders in our communities. So super excited to, to have this space, to continue to grow this space. I feel like I um, come from this as well. I started again in 2010, um, freshman year of college, um, well, 2009, shifting from high school to college and, um, and still in this movement and now leading the C3 table in the state of Arizona. So it just goes to show. And that's my dog, he snores so loud and I'm gonna not know what to do because <laughs> uh, if I kick him out, he'll just start crying. Um, so I apologize, he'll be better. Um, <clears throat> that I come from that too, um, that I'm a young leader that has continued in this work. But this is some of the partners that are a part of the Youth Power Coalition. Some are official One Arizona members and others are just a part of this breakout or working group. Um, some groups like PERG and ASA are solely or very much just focused on student and student work while groups like Poder in Action, Puente, ACE, which is better known as Lucha, is doing, um, you know, adult immigrant people organizing as well as youth organizing. <clears throat> but just some highlights here um, from this slide that I wanted to share. This year, Poder, Poder in Action and Puente have been able to do huge shifts at the city of Phoenix level around policing and keeping police accountable as well as the city around resources for uh, reallocating resources and um, are pushing to be a part of a citizen review board that Poder themselves have really, really pushed. And I said this in an interview not too long ago, like the su success that we're finding in cities and it's happening really quickly in ways that didn't happen for us in 2010, like we did voter registration and governor Brewer still was elected. You know, that was a huge reality hit that like, oh uh, shit, change takes a long time. Like this is a long run and we're still in it. And these young people, both from Poder and Puente and very much from ACE as well, have been doing and pushing their high school district, the city for a long time. So when the, you know, the marches here locally started to happen after um, George Floyd, we saw things start to pick up quicker, but it's because folks were able to find a space in existing places. So BLM was already super active. These few orgs were already super active. So there was a place for new organizers, new energy to be caught. And that was only possible because these organizations are already supported. They're a part of this network and uh, more and more continuing to show their worth, even if um, they're not necessarily the big players when it comes to door knocking or mailing, right, when on, um, on and around GOTV time. So again, that's something that we're really trying to emphasize that this is the, the energy and the breath that organizations like youth um, advocacy organizations bring to the overall coalition work, overall turnout work is humongous. Um, and I'll also share in 2018, we did, uh, and we're, we, what we come together and do as a coalition is civic engagement work that looks like voter registration, census, GOTV um, this year. So we have a huge census effort and voter registration and soon GOTV, but we've had to shift. In 2018, we did 191,000 voter registrations, 46% of which were of people under 35. And that is because our organizations are so young, our canvassers and organizers are so young. So they're attracting people that are young too. Um, and this year we were able to do 35,000 voter registrations from January to March, but had to shift to online work. So if you move to the next slide, um, you'll kind of see how we've shifted, how we're getting creative to continue to meet folks where they're at. Um, I don't want us to give all our resources to Facebook, use buying digital ads 
um, and we're trying to figure out how to and keep investing in our communities. Um, we were fortunate enough after March when we shut down to keep all our organizers and canvassers on staff by switching them over to phone banking and text banking. Um, so you can see, I, I did a little GIF of a phone bank, a text bank that we had together, sending out thousands of texts to folks to remind them um, about the, the vote, voting around the presidential preference election, I believe this one was, because in Arizona it is close to parties, so you have to update to participate in that. And then we have Ace on the other side here doing a drive-through event. I don't know how well folks can see that slide, but it was really, it, was, it worked out really great. We had different like tents and really secure locations to have folks come and be able to register in person. Arizona has had online voter registration for a long time. We're one of the first, but it's so outdated. We've, we haven't changed it since we put it up and you can register on a physical form without a driver's license with your you still have to be matched don't get me wrong like there you still might not make it on the poll on the rolls but you can at least try to register and um, when you do it online you can't and we just were able to win um having folks that don't have a traditional address that, um like um, our native community who hadn't been able to register online now can though it's still clunky we're still fixing it and that's just as of 10 days ago and the voter registration deadlines October 6th and then we're in the middle of September. Um, now can register with a non-traditional address. So we're trying to pressure our local government that things need to change ASAP so folks can vote this year that everything in our lives have changed except for our, um, our election timeline. And another neat thing that we're doing Native Vote reminding me of that is we're commissioning with artists across the state. This is in San Carlos, Arizona, a reservation up north to do um, murals and just visual art. Folks are still working, folks are still driving around. So we're putting up artwork, putting up street signs to remind folks of their power, um, their ability to vote. Um, sorry, one minute, okay. Um, so again, just trying to get really creative, trying to um, connect with folks in person. It's really hard to do the digital work. It's, it's a grind and it's easy to walk away from an ad in ways that it's not easy to walk away from me trying to register you at the grocery store. So we're trying to um, mend that by doing some, some, some different activities. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monse. Um, and thank you so much for sharing the work that um, has advanced this year, um, even amidst the pandemic, to start sort of like formalizing the Arizona Youth Power Coalition. Uh, YEF is super committed to supporting um, the coalitions and collaboratives uh, forming at the state level. Um, and anyone who's interested in le learning more about that, we're happy to engage you in those conversations as well. Uh, so we're going to go ahead um, and wrap up the last presentation before we take questions um, and go back to Georgia. Uh, so I remember, uh, as I shared earlier, when I first met you, Michelle, um, I was really excited when you were like, yeah, there's like 65 of us that are in this like group chat of all young people who are doing civic engagement in Georgia. Um, so I think um, if you can speak a little bit to the opportunities that you see um, on, on supporting um, infrastructure uh, for youth leadership um, and for youth to be able to advance, you know, more solid, solidified civic engagement efforts for the long run in Georgia. Um, and what is some of the work that uh, Women Engage um, is doing to, to make that happen? Definitely. Thank you so much for that. So um, I want to kind of talk a little bit. I want to ground us a little bit in like what life was like before the pandemic. Let's take a trip, you know? So um, as far as like looking at what like our community outreach strategy was like beforehand, uh, we do a mixture. We talked about phone and text bank, of course, because of 2020, but we would also do in-person election protection and also go to like different areas that we frequent the most. I think one of the biggest ways that I feel like we really invest in our community is just by listening. That middle picture there is actually the East Point Farmer's Market, which is a small suburb right outside of Atlanta. And we were actually invited there by somebody who was on our team. 
And I think it's really, again, important about bringing people in to where we are going into their communities, giving them the tools to just have those conversations with their neighbors and really rooting it there in community and with young people. Because the reality is that, to my point previously, is that when things are very transactional, especially for young people, there's a tendency to bring young people in and be like, okay, you're just regulated to just social media or these things that are in the background and really bringing them in real leadership roles to where they can see things that are happening and how they're directly impacting it is very crucial to that. So um, that kind of brings me to my next slide where I'm talking a little bit more about the darker side of Georgia in terms of our infamous voter suppression. So <laughs> this picture here is actually taken from uh, 2018 during that uh, very major election between Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp. Um, and this was at one of the precincts in one of the communities that we actually work in where myself and one other um, young organizer we were actually tasked with bringing wires and snacks to the precinct and it turned out they were trying to close three hours early um, and there was a huge fight in trying to get them to keep the location open this is probably one eighth of what that line actually looks like it wraps around the building like three times inside um, and it was definitely a very interesting night but for us and our organization we see a direct tie to the tactics that are used to suppress and deny people's voting rights to the ways in which certain things are moved, especially when it comes to reproductive justice and just overall like uh, personal autonomy to our own bodies. And so um, that brought us into 2019 where we started doing some mobilization efforts. So we definitely um, had an issue around the abortion bans that were going around. So Georgia along with, I think it was like eight to nine other states passed a similar abortion ban and we were able to mobilize young people to bring them into the Capitol, provide tools on how to lobby their legislators and really demystify the process. I think when we start talking about youth civic engagement, a lot of focus is focused on the vote, but it's definitely a piece about bringing young people into a place that historically has never really been that opening to young people and really supporting them in a real way. So that means that making sure that we're getting people food knowing that because of the way that wages are situated that if people are taking their time to come out here that they need to be supported in that way because the idea is that you if you have to take off work to go to the capitol and do this kind of work that that's something that needs to happen so these are actually some of our young people who were uh, doing demonstration up in the gallery during the first hearing on the floor for the abortion ban and so really being able to mobilize in these efforts and support young people in particular and making sure that we're not only doing some of the work as far as outreach in the ways that people have seen us, but also that we're in the forefront and that we're visible and that we're being taken seriously and invested in a very real way. Um, and so I think, again, though, sometimes we look at the very macro level thing. So of course, 2020 is a huge year because of the federal positions. This was a huge time for the state level, but really it starts at the heart of local community. So um, what we have here is actually a picture on the left. We, um, I will say our Canvas team is comprised of mostly like about 80% young people, people who are under the age of 35. Um, and we were actually able to host a candidate forum. We host candidate forums for East Point and College Park to small cities outside of Atlanta, each um, municipal cycle that they have. And this past time that we did it last year, a number of people didn't even know that they had an election coming up in that area until we text them about a candidate forum that we were hosting. And in conjunction with that, we were also able to do some door knocking around the census and just provide that, also, that same type of conversation. Because the reality is, is that while we're having these conversations with people about voting and stuff, there sh it should always be tied back to how we can get them involved about the things that really matter most to them. So we were actually able to have a great deal of engagement here because at the core of this is really about voter education and voter outreach that, be, that goes beyond that of the ballot box. So um, here's just some of my favorite pictures of my uh, folks is that like it starts at bus stations. It starts by having these conversations with people and getting them to take the first step. I think a lot of times there's a lot of work about trying to spread out in the ways that we're doing things when what we really need is a deeper investment in cultivating relationships with the people that we know. Because, um, and Tiffany brought this up before, is that it's really about the messenger and not necessarily like the notoriety of the person that is, that is actually saying the message. And that's where we are at, is that it's really about making sure that we're having folks talking to their community, talking to their best friends, talking to their families, 
about things that are beyond the headline to really have this conversation. So I want to kind of bring it, I talked a little bit about the narrative, I want to talk a little bit about the, quali the quantitative and talk about our voter turnout comparisons. So in 2015 and 2019 were the municipal elections and in 2014 we actually had a historic uh, gubernatorial election then as well where we had four black women running um, for um, like four of the highest positions in the state. And then of course 2016 we're very much familiar with that. And, um, and in 2017 Atlanta had a municipal election. What we see here actually in the diagram is that when we talk to people over and over again and cultivate relationships, they actually turn out to vote much higher than those that we don't talk to compared to the local averages. So what we see is that we actually need to have a much deeper connection with people that extends beyond major election years. Um, and so that brings me to what we're talking about like on the horizon as far as coming up, of course, is the November election, but also how we're gonna continue this amount of support beyond November's election. Making sure that we're not only you know, creating connections this year, but that we're sustaining these connections in a very sustainable way and that we're adequately supporting young people. So then the, turn the turnover rate can actually decrease because oftentimes people discount the struggles that young people are facing when it comes to being fully present. But the reality is, is that tuition is at an all time high, wages have not increased. There are housing issues as far as being able to find sustain, like secured housing in areas that we need to be in. And so it's really important that we invest in folks in that way. Here in Atlanta, we actually have municipal, like a, a, a large number of municipal elections occurring in a number of areas next year. We're also, of course, preparing for the possibility of a runoff election. For the past couple of years in Georgia, there have been runoff elections since like, at least since I started. So we did one for the municipal in Atlanta. We did one in 2018 because um, while there was a lot of conversation around the um, Brian Kim versus Stacey Abrams, the Secretary of State position actually went into a runoff. So we ended up continuing to do that voter outreach then. So we're actually preparing for that this year as well. Of course, with the census wrapping up at the end of this month, um, we are also looking to uh, talk about redistricting. Our legislative session starts at the top of the year. And one of the biggest things that really hurts our vote is around how they redraw maps that favor one party over another. And so with that, I, I, my biggest takeaway here is that when we invest in community, community shows out. And community is able to actualize and say the things that they need to say. And so it's really important that we continue to um, invest in folks in this way, that we sustain this beyond high stake elections, and that we're adequately supporting young people in the ways that they need us to be, be supported. So that way we can fully show up and fully participate in all aspects of civic engagement when it comes to voting and beyond. Thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing, um, and Tiffany and Monse uh, for your presentations and for um, you know bringing us along in, in your journey uh, on your work. So yeah, I mean, I think I just really want to emphasize what everyone has shared. Um, you know, and I know that a lot of us are focused on what's going to happen over the next few weeks. Um, and well, that's really important and it's already underway as you have heard from all of the speakers. Um, we are also stepping into a new decade. Um, and I just want to emphasize that power building and transformational change that is gonna last through generations takes time and takes adequate funding, right? Um, I think about, uh, you know, even when we think about Arizona and Georgia now becoming battleground states, that didn't happen overnight and it didn't start in 2018 with the midterm elections. You know, it was at least a 10 year long investment of the development of the young people that are now running these organizations and these campaigns um, and of building the infrastructures to be able to sustain that work over the long run. Wow. So I want to go ahead and move into uh, the first question that we have here. So there's a super appreciation of the emphasis on youth leadership development, uh, which is you know, a key strategy to be able to advance the work. Um, and I'm actually going to post this one to, to you, Tiffany. Um, we, we've shared several spaces together, and you've also been part of a lot of uh, cross-movement building and leadership development spaces. So it says, what have you seen as key ingredients in supporting leaders and leadership development as a core power building strategy? Hold on, I'm sorry. I'm in DC and we just got the um, Amber Alert for the flash flood warning. Can you ask me one more time, please? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that was really loud, I'm sorry. 
And if you do need to step away, let us know. No, no, no. I'm in the house. I'm safe. Go ahead. <laughs> Safety first. Okay, so the question is, uh, what have you seen as the key ingredients in supporting leaders and leadership development as a core power building strategy? Thank you for the question. Um, by nature of the question, I'm going to uh, assume that we all agree that leadership development is a core part of the power building strategy. So I'm not even going to talk about that. Um, but the, the key elements and, and other folks can chime in um, on the panel that I see are, are, are really um, multifaceted. We actually do a whole uh, three-day training on leadership development, so I'm going to try to compile that into a two-minute answer. The first, in my experience, is you got to make sure that um, the relationships that we have with leadership development are not transactional, but transformational. Every single person on my staff team is somebody that I know personally. And I know that there are like management center uh, ideas around getting too close to your colleagues and et cetera. But what I mean by getting to them personally is I know, for example, that um, I have a young student right now who for the first time ever is in her first relationship with, with um, somebody who is the same sex as her, a same sex relationship. It is her first time ever being in a same-sex relationship. She's also um, uh, writing a report for the NAACP on police brutality. She is also the president of their NAACP chapter. She's also a senior right now trying to graduate in May, but she also has a mother who's in the hospital because of COVID. And so she is trying to navigate all of these things. Sorry, I just got the notification again. Um, and I'm fine, I'm in the house, but the rain outside is really bad. Okay. so. Um, Apologies. Um, and so, so here's what I mean by leadership development. Because I know all of those things about this young woman, and I didn't just ask her, are you gay? How's your mom? Like, what school do you go to? Are you about to graduate? That's not how that happens. It happens through relationships. And because I know these things about, about them, um, I, I know now that there are certain things that I can ask them to do, and there's things that I can't ask them to do, relationship-wise for the work. I'm not gonna ask them to organize a march for March for Our Lives or for the March on Washington. I'm not gonna ask them to write a press release. I'm not gonna ask them to go live with me on Instagram because they're occupied. And my priorities for them are to make sure that they graduate. I asked them, we had a check-in call um, when I was at the nail salon like two weeks ago. And I said, you know, tell me all the big things that you're working on and then put them in order of priority. And they said, okay. So they told me my relationship, my family, my school and NAACP. I said, cool, now break it down by percentages. They broke it down by percentages and school only got like 15 to 17% out of 100. And I said to them, I said, well, isn't school like you graduating your number one priority? They said, yeah. I said, well, why does it have the lowest percentage of your time and energy, right? So we operate as organizers and national leaders, but sometimes we're like their big sister, big brother. Sometimes we're like their coach, we're their mentor, et cetera. And so the leadership development that I'm going through is to make sure that I understand not just what they're going through and how I can navigate their leadership development, but to also know what it is that they care about. I know that this person really deeply cares about the COVID health pandemic and schools reopening and closing because their mother's in the hospital, right? So I'm gonna direct them to that work. I'm not gonna ask them to go do work for um, immigration because that's not what they're focused on right now. I, I know them. Ali said this earlier and all of us have said it, that level of engagement is the most um, evidence-based successful way of leadership development ever. I got into my job, not because I saw a job announcement on LinkedIn. I got into this work because unfortunately violence chose me and I was trying to figure out how to fix it. And somebody found me and said, hey, you can sign this postcard that can go to Congress, that can get money for the Department of Education to give money to the state so that we don't raise your tuition anymore. Hey, did you know that there's an uh, opportunity for us to fight for um, ethnic studies at our school? And because there were solutions that were offered to me, I felt empowered to to engage and connect with those people to then fight for that longer term peace and so then i won three elections at my college and then i graduated and i was elected nationally for the united states Student association to be the vice president uncontested right i didn't know i'd be a national organizer i didn't even know that this was a job <laughs> but because there are people and i didn't know i can get paid for it right because there are people who and black women specifically i'm gonna be very transparent about this because there are black women specifically who found me and said, we see you, we hear you, we know that you wanna make a difference, try these things. 
And it, 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 is, a, is, it is a skill set that you might not learn in school and that sometimes you can't just learn from a job, but that you learn from real hands-on experiences. And so I have a list of like 300 young people that I am tracking through the leadership development pipeline. We have a staff team and we assign who's gonna talk to who so we can build stronger relationships with folks. But unless we have the infrastructure of the staff to focus on field work, unless we have the infrastructure of staff to focus on building young leaders, we're not gonna be successful. I know that the, the popular thing to do, it was really interesting to see the poll and less than 25% of y'all's budget goes to young black pe young people of color. That's alarming to me because if your budget goes to comms, <laughs> then you're not building the capacity on the ground. If, you're, if yours goes to just research and it's mostly research, that's great. But how are you connecting and building with the folks who can be the next group of researchers for the work that we wanna do? And the, way, the only way that we're able to do that is not through Zoom, not through Instagram Live, not through a link that they have to fill out in the survey, but through actual relationship building that still is possible, even though we have to socially distance. So I hope that answered the question. That was a great one. Thank you so much, uh, Tiffany. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, I don't know how, how much more we can emphasize the, the importance of, of relationship. Um, it, I mean, I think all of us here on the panel, um, you know, this is why we, this is how we came into this work and how we're able to continue um, as we've grown, right, in our different roles of leadership in this work. Um, it's essentially because we have each other's back, right? Um, and that's the kind of culture and environment that, um, that is going to allow for the work to move forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to move on to uh, one more question. Uh, it says, um, I work in a community with a large Latinx community. Um, however, there's little representation of Latinx in positions of power in different organizations. What are some suggestions you can share to help increase representation uh, and participation? So I'm going to move that one question to you, Monse. Um, I know that a large of the, uh, of the leaders and the population that you work with um, are Latinx. So if you can speak to how you've seen that uh, play out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that um, we're still fighting to see better representation at our like government level, but we have done a better job at um, our organizational level. And some things that have worked really nicely for us is um, co-directorships and supporting that, um, deputy directorships and supporting that. Those are some of the ways that we work, we work to fit in roles to help folks have the space to learn from folks that have been in the work for longer um, and then put it in a way that, you know, <clears throat> philanthropies or donors are like, oh, I understand that. I can get behind that. Uh, so I, I guess like labeling it in a way that makes sense to the, the money world. Uh, but those are things that have helped us and um, it is still a learning space. Um, so keep be, be mindful of that. Like if someone's coming into a de deputy directorship, that they're there to learn from the executive director, that you know they are in many ways shadowing and adapting and learning, and that the expectations of them aren't to keep doing what they were already doing before, they just have a different title. So I think that's a hiccup or that's something that we still need to be better about, that um, we are putting folks in new roles and then actually mentoring them and, and they're learning what, what that next level is. And we, we have a hard time with that because we're in the middle of elections or there's fires to put out during the legislative session um, or the pandemic starts. So we have to figure out how to go from in-person to online. So I'll say even us groups that are um, POC led and Tiffany said it like you were not in it for, for us and we came to this work because we were in other work. So we're just all kind of moving and climbing the ladder um, <clears throat> in a sense, um, but um, still need to like pass the knowledge and continue to work from each other. So I'd say like, don't forget that piece and, or make sure that that's embedded. Thank you, Monse. Uh, we have one more question, um, but I want to just uh, sort of piggyback off of what, what Monse said. So in March, YEF um, had conversations with all of our movement partners, um, and really the conversation was just, was just to check in on how they were, right? Like, are you safe? Is your family safe? Um, 
Do you have what you need? Um, and one of the things that we realized, particularly for um, executive directors um, uh, who are, you know, it was mostly women of color, young people, um, there is a huge need for coaching executive support, which is not often part of the budgets of folks' organization. And in a year like this, right, like having the ability to be able to troubleshoot uh, with someone who can support you that might be outside of your team is crucial. So with YEF, one of the things that we're advancing uh, by the end of the year is that we're going to be moving forward a multi-year um, Black Indigenous Youth of Color cohort. Uh, we're hoping to have 10 to 15 uh, groups over the course of two years that we can support um, with, with grants, uh, with major grants, and also capacity building training, executive coaching. Um, and also working with our research partner circle uh, to be able to evaluate and, um, and uh, sort of like document the work over the course of the two years. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more about that, um, please do reach out. And with that, I'm just going to move on to the last question, um, which is around, it says, um, with so many campuses shut down, what are the best strategies you are finding to reach and engage college students in this work? Um, so Michelle, do you want to take this one on? Yes, thank you. Um, I will say right now, it's really, you know, we've been talking about relations, but it's really like a who knows who. I will say, um, because we directly uh, hire students, it's about asking them who they know, but also someone else that you can also tap are professors. So now that we're in a very virtual space, it's actually much easier to get a captured audience by just talking to professorships and I think overall, like what this pandemic is really teaching us is that like a lot of the stuff that we did, like there was a process, like you would go to like an official person with the campus, you would have to have these conversations and stuff like that, that now we're looking at a much more relaxed, much more personable interaction as far as like how to get in. Because right now the thing is, is that we're dealing with a crisis upon crisis upon crisis, but a number of educators in college and also in high school are overwhelmed and are actually looking for opportunities for people to kind of come in and talk to their students for them, even if that's like very helpful. So you could actually incorporate that into some of that um, as well. And so like make, making sure that we're just leading with the times. And when we do have those conversations with the students too, also making sure that we're in a space that we kind of let go of this need for perfection that I think is um, sometimes a little bit off-putting the, the reality is, is when I'm talking to like people my age and younger, like I may not sound as like put together, if that makes sense, or, um, you know, like using um, a little bit more relaxed language is so key and crucial because the thing is, is that, um, and we talked about this, is that like people want to know that you're human. People want to know that we're human. And right now people are really valuing connection right now. So I think that um, when it comes to new ways, it's really about like a who knows who, really reaching out to these professors now because everybody is on Zoom and they have like these very um, smaller spaces and also just reaching out into the young people that you've already connected in and also bringing them in too. So like what I'm doing in this part is that it's like, it's not me coming into a classroom. It's like, hey, I'm reaching out to students and then they're also a part of leading this conversation um, with folks um, there as well. Thank you, Michelle. All righty, so we have five minutes left. I feel like every time we have these conversations, it's never enough time, even though we've already been chatting for almost two hours. Um, so uh, we did have another Jamboard uh, activity for you all um, on learnings and reflections. Uh, we are cutting it a little bit close to time. So what we're gonna do is that um, you'll see the link again on the, on the chat uh, for learning and reflections. Uh, same idea as last time with two questions. Uh, the first question is on, um, oh gosh, I think I lost it, sorry. Well, you'll see the two questions there. Um, and if you can just, you know, take your own time to, to fill that out. I'm going to stay on for an extra five minutes if anybody wants to do that. Uh, but we also do have uh, another poll. So we're going to, I think, do the poll now um, since that one is attached to Zoom. So whenever you're ready. Okay, oops, I think the poll went away. There you go. Okay, 
So uh, the first question on the poll is, do you have a better understanding of the role of youth of color leading civic engagement work? Yes or no? The second question is, do you feel like you can go back to your colleagues and talk about what it could look like for your institution to support youth of color led organizing and civic engagement? The third question is, by what percentage do you think your institution should increase their giving from what you currently give to youth of color led work? And the last question is, are you super motivated and re-energized by the leadership of this amazing young women of color panel and will think of them, their work and vision in your roles moving forward? So we're gonna give a few minutes for you all to answer those questions. Um, and I actually, um, as you do that, I also am gonna post a, a quote here on the chat. Um, where is it? Here you go. Sort of um, as an invitation um, and a reminder that, um, you know, for, for the importance of this work, um, during the 2018 midterm elections, we did see youth voter turnout spike uh, to a hundred year high, right? Uh, but I think what's been made clear is that this is not just about um, us being election years and supporting the work during that time, but this is really about year round organizing. And it's about in-depth leadership development of individual leaders supporting the infrastructure, the scaling and growth of organizations, um, and also of collaborations and state level work um, that is going to help amplify the voices and the efforts uh, of the work that is happening uh, on the ground. Um, and here on the chat, I had put uh, just sort of like a brief story um, from, uh, from supporters, right? When we're, th we're, we're all here uh, as philanthropic partners. Um, and I think what I wanna invite you into is to really, really step up your leadership. How can we move those numbers, you know, of less than 25% to, to be higher and to be more in alignment with the belief that we have that young people of color are gonna play a huge role uh, in transforming uh, our democracy. Um, and the, this chat here says that um, in 1964, um, the singer uh, Harry Belafonte uh, and Sidney Poitier, they, they went to raise money uh, to make sure that the Freedom Summer Schools kept going, right? And they knew that they were at risk. This goes back to what Tiffany was talking about. Like, you know, imagine the severity of the situation for people to put like their physical lives at risk. Um, and this has been happening for a long time. So I wanna invite you all to leap in and to take that risk within your institutions and within your roles um, to, to continue to support this work. So I'm just gonna share here the, the post. So do you have a better understanding? 100% yes. Do you feel like you can go back to your colleagues? Uh, most of you said, heck yes. Some of you need more support. So for those of you who need more support, um, you'll see the slide here. You'll see the information for uh, the three panelists um, that spoke. Um, and you can reach out to any of them directly. Uh, you can also reach out to me and I'm happy to share with you about the work that, um, that we're doing at YF. And I'm also happy to connect you with other groups. Um, we do work mostly in the South and Southwest. Um, so there are other partner organizations um, that are not present here that are doing very similar and active work um, to what you all heard of heard about today. Um, and I think with with that we'll wrap it up. Um, and again, thank you all so much for for joining us in this afternoon. Thank you, Tiffany, Michelle, and Monse. I know that you all are always uh, very active and busy. So I just super appreciate you all um, sharing your wisdom um, and your energy to activate us, um, not just for the rest of this year, but for the long run. And thank you, NFG, um, and congratulations on, on 40 years. <laughs>